It is 1834. How does your brain work? You know that you're capable of conscious thought, smarter than your average human. At least, that's what you think. And you know that the thoughts that cross your mind must have some kind of reason to them. The intellectual faculties. Causality. How you think logically. Located in the protuberances halfway on the forehead. Comparison. Your ability to compare and create analogies. Located on the middle of the forehead. Human nature. Your intuitive knowledge of character. The median line of the forehead. Constructiveness. Your capacity to plan and construct, to design and invent. Found on the temples. Reach up. Touch your skull. Feel the little lumps and bumps, the smooth parts and the ridges. It is 1834 and your skull can tell you everything you need to know about your personality, about who you are, and why you are the way that you are. Pay attention though, he's talking. He's telling you that you probably won't get a chance like this again. After all, once the widow's in the tomb, then it's going to be pretty difficult, probably illegal, to ever get in again. And sure, this will drive on the interests of scientific investigation and give you all a greater understanding of how the human brain works, but it's, it's still grave robbing at the end of the day. Mr McDermott says it will be fine, and since he's the president of the club, he should know. Mr McDermott knows everything after all. It was him that put you onto this in the first place. The great phrenological study of the human mind. The energetical faculties. Firmness. Your determination and persistence. The connection between principles and actions, located on top of the skull, just behind the perpendicular line drawn from the oral conduct upwards. Self-esteem. Your self-love and dignity. Destructiveness. Your dynamism, fighting spirit, expressed in anger, violence, cruelty, vengeance, located above the ears. If this faculty is strong, the area above the ears will appear convex. Cautiousness. Fear and shyness that slows down activity. On the sides of the skull behind the perpendicular line. Approbativeness. Your desire for success and praise. Your vanity. Found on either side of self-esteem. Anyway, once the widow's in there, they'll seal it up and that'll be that. Everyone's in agreement that on the last night of March, a Monday for what it's worth, you and the rest of the committee of the Dumfries Burns Club will go to St Michael's Churchyard, unlock the black wrought iron gates on the sandstone mausoleum, and disinter the worldly remains of Scotland's national poet. This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. The perceptive faculties. Locality. The sense of location and the memory for places and locations, found above the eyebrows. Individuality. Your ability to notice details, positioned between the eyebrows. Eventuality. Your memory of facts and events. Dumfries, 23rd of July, 1796. Sir, Robert Burns, my father, died on Thursday morning last and is to be interred in the churchyard here on Monday next at one o'clock afternoon. Your attendance at the funeral is requested by Sir, your most humble servant, Robert Burns. It is Monday 25th of July, 1796. To say that the town of Dumfries has come out for this one would be an understatement. The rumour had been doing the rounds for weeks that Robert Burns was on his deathbed. The rheumatism was finally catching up to him. The rumours themselves were a bit more salacious, suggesting that he'd been found drunk on the roadside in a rainstorm, but those who knew him knew that he'd been barely able to get over the door in months and struggled to get around without help. But that hadn't diminished his popularity. You see it on the street from first light, as well-wishers from the town and all around pour into Dumfries to see the bard on his way. He's given full military honours, despite not wanting them and thousands watch on as a firing squad shoots three volleys into the summer morning sky. His wife Jean was in labour at home just round the corner, about to give birth to their ninth child. She would have heard the shots cracking out from the soldiers' rifles. 
she had paid for a slab of freestone, a modest piece of sandstone like the one his father was buried under in Alloway, inscribed with one word in block capitals, Burns. A lot of people thought that that was a bit paltry for a man of his stature, but Jean didn't see them putting their hands in their pockets. The area of love. Affection. Describes true friendship and selfless love. It is located on the upper back of the head. When positive, the back of the head is convex. When negative, it is flat. Acquisitiveness. Your greed. Your desire for more. On the lower part of the temple, below ideality. Secretiveness. Your discretion, diplomacy. Lives beneath destructiveness and cautiousness. Amativeness. The arousal of feelings of sexual desire. Located on the lower back of the head, behind the ears. He hadn't exactly been a perfect husband. If you've listened to the other episodes of Scotland on Robert Burns, then you'll know that his relationship with his wife was often fraught, thanks to his drinking and, uh, shall we say carousing? Jean Armour was, for all intents and purposes, a very patient woman, and having taken in several of her husband's illegitimate children, you could be forgiven for her being annoyed at the suggestion that she disrespected his memory. After all, she had a huge family to provide for, and began trying to secure a decent future for them, out of the worldwide fame which their father found following his death. The family published a four-volume edition of his complete works, along with a biography written by the man who blamed Burns' death on the demon drink. They raised subscriptions, like a Georgian Patreon, link in the show notes, to get the book published, and according to reports at the time, the payments were shockingly slow. But eventually funds were raised, and the widow armour was able to provide a good life for her children, from the ashes of Robert's untimely death. He was only 37, remember? She outlived him by 38 years, and was around when his body was first disinterred in 1817, and moved from the small grave plot in the north of St Michael's Kirkyard to the ornate sandstone mausoleum that a huge worldwide fundraising drive had paid for. Two of her sons, who had died in childhood, were reinterred along with their father, and when she died in 1834, she was to be laid to rest there too. But not before the Dumfries Burns Club could have their way with the body of the bard. The moral faculties. Veneration. The higher aspirations of values. The quest beyond terrestrial existence. On top of the skull. Between spirituality and benevolence. Spirituality. The creation of spiritual values in life. A strong spirituality gives the skull a dome shape. A weak spirituality gives it the ogival shape. Benevolence. Your true, unbiased kindness and altruism, located in the upper part of the forehead. This part is very convex when benevolence is strong. A slanted forehead often comes with a negative benevolence. Ideality. Your disposition towards beauty and refinement in all aspects of life. Ideality creates the width of the temples. A weak ideality means narrow temples. Conscientiousness your attachment to moral values. By 1834, it was difficult to escape the trendy pseudoscience of phrenology, a study that claimed that the brain was made up of different individual organs, which controlled different emotions and tendencies. You've heard them all now, although there was debate about how many there actually were. Was it 27? Was it 40? Was it some number in between? Not only did it succinctly describe supposed human nature, it also allowed white people to write off people of colour as being savages based on the number and shape of bumps on their skull. For Victorian thinkers, it was a win-win. But it did lead to a conundrum for those who believed you could tell a person's character by their skull alone. Whose skulls were you supposed to study? Surely any Tam, Dick or Hamish on the street wouldn't do. I mean, for a start, they were alive. Only the leading lights of the world would serve to show man's mastery over his own brain. And it was man's mastery, since women were shunted to the side as having underdeveloped organs for success. 
which brings us to 31st of March, 1834, where six men let themselves into St Michael's Kirkyard at 9pm and steal their way towards the mausoleum. They let themselves in, since they have the key to help with Jean Armour's funeral scheduled for tomorrow. They lift the slab that covers the tomb. They have the cover of Twilight, and the supposed permission of Jean's brother to take the skull. But since Mr McDermott is also the editor of the local paper, and would later write the story that claimed they had permission, the chances that they actually have permission are pretty slim. They open the casket, and they remove the skull of Robert Burns. Archibald Blacklock, the surgeon, explains the marks and ridges on the skull to you as you stand around in the dim lamplight, breathing in the musty cold air of the grave. He rubs his fingertips around the lower rear of the skull, behind where the ears would have been. He says that Burns would have had a small faculty for amativeness, the arousal of feelings of sexual desire. At that point, they should have called the whole thing off, put the skull back and gone back to the drawing board to look for a new theory on human nature. But they didn't. They took the skull away to a local plasterer and had a cast made of it. Joined by the leader of the local town council and the head of Dumfries Academy, the cast now lives in the Edinburgh Anatomical Museum and was used to make a terrifying facial reconstruction of Burns in 2013. Six more casts have been made from the skull over the years, all of increasingly bad quality. Despite the fact that his skull was taken largely without permission and in pursuit of a pseudoscience that would be largely debunked in the decade following its theft, it's an insight into the minds of those phrenologists that the strength of a parasocial relationship with a poet who most of them would never have met gave them the impression that they could just pop by and borrow his skull with no real permission. It's an insight into the darker places in the human psyche. Maybe someone should go back and have a feel of their skulls. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. The music for every episode of Scotland is by our very own amative poet, Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Additional voices in this episode were by Siobhan Buchanan, David Allen and Mitch Bain. This episode references the work of Fife Council's archaeologist Douglas Spears in its account of the removal of Burns' skull. Scotland is supported by Tony B, Mike McQuaid and listeners like you on Patreon. You can get loads more from us for as little as £3 a month at patreon.com forward slash bequietmedia. You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website scotlandpodcast.net and we're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram too. Find us by searching for Scotland, a Scottish history podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after each other. We'll see you next time.